Well, this morning, we're, we'll do announcements and we'll do an offering in praying for that at the end. Uh, I feel like it's appropriate right now just to get directly into today's message. Don't always feel like this, but I just don't want to waste time and waste the atmosphere going over announcements right now. Uh, if you missed last week's message, we were continuing on in, in Acts chapter 2. We began looking at Peter's sermon. I just want to give you a little bit of a recap so that you have the uh, proper context for today's message. That as we were going through it, we were looking at how he shared one of three passages of Scripture. He had pulled back to the book of Joel, and we were talking about how that there would be an ultimate defeat of our enemy, that there would be an ultimate renewal of creation, and that the presence of God would fill his people. And so Peter's trying to explain to everyone that these people, they're, they're not drunk. They've just experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They just experienced the infilling of the Spirit that was being promised all the way back in Joel. Because when we looked at Joel, the, the beautiful thing was it was this idea that the Spirit would not just be poured out on certain individuals, on the kings and on the high priests. But now when the veil was torn, when Jesus died, that the presence of the Holy Spirit would come out and would be able to reside in the young and the old, the male, the female, the Jew, the Gentile, that all flesh would be able to experience this move of the Spirit. And the same is true for today, that we are not a church that believes that, hey, this was really good back then, but we don't use that today, that the, the move of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, that, that was for the early church, and now we just have to kind of deal with things until we make it to heaven. That's not what we believe. And so today we're going to be going through the rest of this sermon from Peter, and then we're going to hit the results. I know I kind of already did when we were doing communion. We're going to very quickly hit the results, and then next time we will really dive into what happens as a result of this message. But first, I want you to go ahead and repeat after me. Heavenly Father, your word is written in my mind and hidden in my heart. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will seek you with all of my strength. My greatest desire is to be a disciple and to make more disciples. I will live my life according to your word, your word, O oh Lord, is eternal. This is Acts 2, verses 22 through 41. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David said concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence." Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that be, he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and all of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the houses of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, that Jesus, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? 
And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourself from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. The people Peter is speaking to know that Jesus is Christ because they saw the mighty works. They saw the wonder. They saw the signs. And so often we have this attitude, if we could just see more wonder, if we could see more miracles, then I would believe. They saw Jesus in the flesh, and they still didn't believe. At a certain point in time, you have to make the conscious decision of saying, you know what, I see it, I may not understand it, I may not have every little piece of information that I want, but I'm going to have the faith and I'm going to move forward that Jesus is God, that Jesus is King, and that I'm going to trust this. These are the very same people that are in part responsible for Jesus' death. Peter is both calling them out and calling them to a place of repentance at the exact same time. But here's the thing that I want you to realize today. They're they're experiencing the Holy Spirit, that Peter is preaching this message. This was God's plan A. God did not have a backup plan. God looked at it and said, I have a way out for you. And it goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. I said it about a week or two ago. I'll say it again today. The Old Testament is Jesus concealed where Jesus is throughout the entire Old Testament. And once we know who Jesus is, once we know what we're looking for, we begin to see things coming out of the Old Testament that we couldn't have until the New Testament, Jesus revealed. And so Jesus is revealed throughout the New Testament and everything moving forward after the the, the Gospels is showing this is where Jesus was, this is where Jesus was, this is what Jesus did, this is who Jesus is. And you start pointing back and you start seeing it all laid out. You see the entire plan from the very beginning and you realize that this is not this fake conspiracy of, oh, the NFL is scripted. No, the Lions just lost. I know some of you are sad. I'm sad and salty, but here's the thing. This is not some grand strategy that the NFL, because they couldn't figure out how to keep it all together. God has scripted his story from the beginning, and he wins. We can laugh about it in conspiracies in our world, but in reality, God is in control. The very things that you are worried about, God already knows what happens. Let let me just give you a newsflash. None of you know what is going to happen in November. God already knows. And God's on the throne today. God will be on the throne on election day. And God will be on the throne a year from now when whoever is president is president. You need to stop worrying about who's going to be president and start worrying about who's sitting on the throne in your own personal life. Because if God's not on the throne, it doesn't matter who's in the White House. I'm going to say that again because I only had half of you respond. It doesn't matter who's sitting in the White House if we don't have God sitting on the throne of our life. Amen. Amen. All right. So here's the thing I want you to realize when we go all the way back to Genesis. God had this habit that he was doing in the very beginning where he was creating something and then he was saying it was good. And I know in our day we lose track of that word good because in our context and in our language of English, Good doesn't sound that great. When you say great and excellent and awesome, it's almost like we have to invent words that are greater than good. But in reality, good meant something different in the Hebrew language. The word that was being used was tov. And so God would create something and would in essence say it was tov, which means it was pleasant, it was right, it was the right thing. And when we look at it, it wasn't just that, oh, that's pretty good. I like that. No, it was the matter that this was good. This is the way that it was supposed to be. God and God alone gets to make the declaration of what is good. When you think of your life, you don't get to just say, well, that's pretty good. That's good enough. No, what's God saying? Is God saying it is good? Now, here's the thing that's interesting. We jump forward a chapter. There's two trees that are in the the garden with Adam and Eve. There's the tree of life, and there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
Imagine that. It's the exact same word that God was saying when he was saying it was good, it was tov. It was the tree of the knowledge of tov and evil. So when all of a sudden Satan comes along and he begins tempting Adam and Eve to eat of that fruit, what he is saying is your eyes will open up, your eyes will be able to perceive things just like God. What Satan is ultimately trying to do to Adam and Eve is take away the right of saying it is good from God and give it to us. And when we take on what is good and evil, something dangerous happens. Go with me for just a moment. There's multiple of you that have already asked me, well, who are you rooting for in the Super Bowl tonight? My response is I want them both to lose. <laughs> because I'm from the, the tribe of Judah. Judah's represented by a lion, and I don't really care about someone who's looking for gold, which is just going to be the pavement in heaven. And I have one chief, and that's Jesus Christ. So I'm going to shake it off and let it go and all those other bad puns I can say. But in reality, here's the thing when we look at fandom. You have a group in this country that really want their team because they believe that their team is good and good enough to win. You have another team over in Kansas City that thinks their team is good enough to win. And it doesn't really matter because one of them is going to lose and they're going to be crying in their Wheaties tomorrow morning. Because one team will win and one team will lose. You can have this idea of what is good and what's not good, but in reality, it's only God who gets to declare what's good. And when you start trying to declare what's good, there is a, if you're following after God, you can make the right decisions, you can make the right proclamations, but the danger is you are a human being and you will have flaws and you will have faults and you will have moments where you don't get it right. Now, the further away you are from God, what ends up happening is you call things that are good, evil, and evil, good. How do I know that? When we look at Isaiah 5, 20 through 21, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise to their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. Guess what word makes its appearance again? Tov. Woe to those who call evil tov and tov evil. Because it's coming back out again. Because here's the problem that happens in our world. We like to make declarations of what is right and what is wrong, but it's only God that gets to make the declarations of what is right and wrong because he's the creator. Now, the further we are from God, the easier it is to make those declarations. And we wonder, well, like the, the world has gone crazy and it's calling good evil and evil good, yes, because they have no standard, because they don't know who God is. But I think the more dangerous thing in our world today is when Christians are calling evil good and good evil, but we're wrong. Because when we get 75% of it right, but that other 25%, our personal opinions are still sneaking into what we're proclaiming and our own rights. Here's the thing. It doesn't matter who's the president now, tomorrow, next year, next decade, two decades from now, because God is still king, right? We, we agreed upon that a moment ago. The thing I know about God's kingdom is God's kingdom grows fastest. It grows in any, uh, in, in any area, but it grows the greatest when it's under persecution. I think a lot of times we like to have leaders that look like us, act like us, talk like us because it means that we don't have to live under persecution. And when we don't have to live under persecution, we get our way. And we get our way, we can just say, well, that's good and that's good and that's good. No, let God declare what's good. Now, do I say that as I want to live under persecution? Absolutely not. But I know that the underground church in China, they're thriving because they actually have to live out what they mean. All around the world, there's people that are losing their lives, they're being kicked out of their families, they're losing everything that they own because they're saying Jesus Christ is Lord. Because they're following after God. And when you start saying, okay, God, you get all of it. You get all the control. Everything that you're calling me to do, I'll go and I'll do. When you give over full control and say, okay, God, you and you alone get to declare what Tov is. In those moments, then all of a sudden things change because now you're speaking on behalf of God, not speaking your opinion of what God should be doing. And so I want to even just put this uh, thought into your minds as well. When Annie and I came here uh, six and a half years ago now to the pastor of this church, I was warned something was going to happen. And some of you are like, well, who warned you? And what did they warn you about? I was warned that something was going to happen the day that we came 
and I was warned that something was going to happen the day that we left. And what I'm referring to, it's the burden of leadership. And I heard it, and I understood, okay, that's going to happen, sure, it, that, that makes sense. But we felt it the day that we were elected and that we were prayed over, because now all of a sudden, everything that happens here at this church, there's a burden that's upon us. Now, that burden is not your burden. That burden is on us as the leaders of this church. Now, we are also told that when we leave, that burden is instantly lifted because it's no longer our burden. It's become somebody else's burden. But here's the thing. If you go and you try to pick up my burden for running this church, that's not your burden. There's not the grace there for you to carry that burden because it's not your burden to carry. God has appointed Annie and I for this time to carry that burden and is giving us what we need. There's things that go on in the church that you have no idea about. And that's good. And because there's things where, like, I'm thinking ahead, what's this church going to look like? What's this church going to be doing two years from now, five years from now, ten years from now? That we need to do this, we need to do that. You don't need to worry about that. You just need to worry about living the life that God has called you to do, faithfully following after him and telling people about Jesus. God appointed us here for this season to carry that weight. Now, here's the, the comparison I want to bring into it. If God were to call us away, whether it's two minutes from now, two days from now, two months from now, two years from now, two decades from now, it doesn't matter when. When God calls us away, if all of a sudden that burden comes uh, off of us and then I say, you know what, God, I really want to pick that burden up and put it back on me again, that would make no sense. So when we are forgiven of our sins, that burden is taken off of us. That burden no longer belongs to us. And the problem is, is when we start trying to call things that are good, evil, and evil good, and we're, we're starting to try to declare it for ourselves, we're trying to put on a burden that's no longer ours because God has set us free from it. All we have to do is say, okay, God, you're the one that declares what good is. You're the one that gets to declare what good and evil, right and wrong, and I'm going to let you do that. So as we set up this whole message, it's this idea that it's not yours, it's God's that God is in control, that God has everything going. It comes about this idea now that we need to prove uh, the prophecy that Jesus is who Jesus said he was. Because if we're going to speak on behalf of God and we're going to allow God to be the one to say that this is good and this is evil, this is right, this is wrong, then we better hope that this Jesus that we're following actually is the Messiah that God had prophesied. So when we look at Psalm 16, 8 through 11, uh, this is one of the things that Peter quotes from. It says, For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul in Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You have made make me full of gladness with your presence." We start seeing this connection between the empty tomb and the resurrection, specifically when David writes a psalm. He says, For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. The body of Christ is not turning back in the dust like all other bodies do. His body doesn't see corruption. His body doesn't stay in the grave. For Jesus' his body and his soul, his resurrected body is in heaven. It is coming back again one day because Jesus Christ is King. David's been buried that David has a tomb. Peter even says that his tomb is with us to this day. But David was speaking of Christ. And that Jesus had just come. That Jesus had just done something unique. Because it was plan A. God knew back in Genesis that this is what just happened. That they ate of the tree they weren't supposed to. I'm going to remove them from the garden because I don't want them eating from the tree of life. There was no issue with the tree of life. The tree of life only became an issue once they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because if they ate of good and evil, and, they, and then they ate of the tree of life, then they would not be able to have lived up to the, the, the covenant of somebody has to die. They would have, in essence, Adam and Eve became like Satan. The fact that they have the knowledge of good and evil, but there is no redemption for them. So God removes us from the garden to protect us from ourselves, and then all of a sudden sets about his plan in motion. When we get to Psalms 110, verse 1, which is the other uh, passage that Peter uh, references, it says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. 
Again, it's the main theme. This is, uh, comes from a prophecy of, uh, a messianic prophecy of Jesus, that Jesus is the Messiah. And we see this power of God, that God made Jesus both Lord and Christ, that Christ's enemies will be made his footstool. We are not Christ's enemies. Other people aren't Christ's enemies. Satan is Christ's enemy. And guess what? He is the defeated enemy. He's one that's not going to be coming back. There is no comeback. There's no backup plan. No matter what he throws, he will lose. But in order to, to realize that, we have to know, notice that we don't get to declare good and evil. You see, if we can declare good and evil, then all of a sudden, if we're wrong, we allow Satan to have a foothold back in our life again. But when God is the one that declares good and evil and we follow after what God has called us to, then all of a sudden everything begins to change because we start doing life the way that God has designed us to do life. When we get to Acts 2, 37 through 38, we see the results of Peter's preaching. That now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's pretty easy instructions, and we make things very complicated. It's a matter of saying, Jesus, would you come into my life? It's the decision to make a public declaration that Jesus Christ is your life because asking Jesus in is a personal thing. Water baptism becomes a public thing. And then you start going out and making disciples of all people. And as we do this, then all of a sudden, I mean, hear just these words again. That uh, repent and be baptized, every one of you, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice how sequential all this is. Now, here's the beautiful thing with grace. You have the thief on the cross next to Jesus. He wasn't water baptized, but there was a public declaration that he was following after Jesus. It all becomes a matter of I need to make it personal, then I need to make it public. And when I make it public and I'm following after God and I'm allowing God to be the one that declares what good and evil is in my life and through me, now all of a sudden I can start making that declaration for others and I'm speaking on behalf of God. And as I speak on behalf of God, it's amazing how the Holy Spirit then comes in and gives you exactly what you need to do the work of God. Because if you're trying to do it under your own power, under your own volition, you will fail. Because when you try to speak for someone else and you're not using their words, you're going to misquote them and you're going to put them in the wrong position. But when all of a sudden you've spent time in the Word, you've spent time in prayer, you've spent time with the Father, you can speak on behalf of the Father and you don't miscommunicate what the Father is trying to say. And we look at this moment of Pentecost as this great expansion of the kingdom because people of all tongues and tribes and nations, they come together. The kingdom is expanded and 3,000 people in one instant all of a sudden say, you know what, I want to repent. Let me get water baptized. And then you have to make the assumption as we hear this that that means that all these people begin receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What a day. What a day where all of a sudden 3,000 people's lives are radically changed and transformed. And here's the thing that I want you to hold on to. When 3,000 people all of a sudden accept Jesus, make a public declaration and are water, are, and by being water baptized and then receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it didn't just stop there. We're going to get into this more next time. But here's the thing that, let's just come back to the end of this uh, chapter. Praising God and having favor with all the people, the Lord added to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. Because you went from 120 in an instant to 3,120, and now all of a sudden you've got a lot of people that are excited. There are a lot of people that are speaking, a lot of people that have experienced God, a lot of people that have had miracles happen, a lot of people that are all of a sudden saying, this is who my God is, this is who he is, this is what he's doing, this is how he moved in my life, this is how he can move in your life. And then all of a sudden the church goes from 3,120 the 6,280, and I'm going to stop doing my math there because it's too complicated. But all of a sudden, multiplication is happening, and the church is growing, and people are getting excited, and people are experiencing life change. 
And then all of a sudden the church goes through persecution. So the persecuted church begins to scatter. And as the persecuted church begins to scatter, they go into this city, into this town, into this village. And all of a sudden new churches begin popping up. And new disciples are being raised up. And new pastors and new leaders. And all of a sudden those churches start getting persecuted. So they scatter again. We shouldn't be scared by anything of this world because no weapon formed against us shall prosper. But all of a sudden at some point in time in our life, we began believing that if I get persecuted, that means the world's against me. And so I need to hunker down and just... I need to make it to heaven safe. I need to make it to heaven living a long, perfect life where nobody ever hurt me or called me mean names. No. When people begin speaking badly against you, you begin turning the other cheek. Stop saying, hey, you hit me here, let me slug you back. I got a better right hook than you do. The scripture doesn't say that. Scripture says turn the other cheek because now all of a sudden when someone hits you on this side, you can say, hey, Jesus still loves you. Because if Jesus could be crucified on your behalf, in my behalf, then I think we can take a little slap uh, cheek. But we need to realize the fact that they started doing something different here. That they began devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. They began devoting themselves to fellowship with one another. Let me just say this. Nothing wrong with going on a vacation. So don't hear that when I make this statement. But when you wake up on a Sunday morning, you say, you know what? It's just a really beautiful day. I think I'm going to sit on my patio. I I feel perfectly good. Everything is awesome. And I just won't go to church today. That breaks the flow of what the move of God is trying to do. All of a sudden, the church is not united and on the same page. When they devoted to the fellowship to one another, all of a sudden, the church began to grow. They began joining in the breaking of bread, of participating in communion, realizing that this is what Jesus did then, this is what Jesus is doing now, and this is what Jesus is going to do tomorrow. And prayers, you cannot overlook prayer. The most important thing that is on our schedule, besides joining together, should be our prayer meetings. If you can make time for all the fun stuff, you should be making time to be in the, prayer, uh, the presence of God praying. And then helping one another financially and with generosity. Here's the thing. It's really easy to say, it's all about me. Let me take care of me, and then if I've got anything left over, I'll help someone else. That's not what Scripture says that they did. Scripture says that they gave of anyone that was in need. And even as we begin unpacking the rest of chapter 2 and chapter 3, you're going to see this fact that money is not necessarily the root of everybody's issue. And God, a lot of times, has to deal with what your issue is so that that issue can take care of itself. And ultimately, in worship team, go ahead and come back up. I'm all over the place. I'm sorry, but we're just going to keep going. I believe fully that we need to put forth uh, our best effort to impact the kingdom of God. We need to put forth our best effort knowing the fact that if we want to see Jesus move in ways that Jesus is not moves Uh, in a while. If we want to see Jesus do things that we have never seen Jesus move or do, we need to be willing to do different things. We need to be willing to change and change ourselves because here's the thing. God's word doesn't change. The content can't change. But our methods and our strategies can change. Because as we hit different contexts, we have to say, you know what, I'm willing to do this a little bit different. I'm willing to stretch. I'm willing to, to make this change, make that change. But I will not compromise the Word of God. Because the Word of God was good enough then, it's good enough now, and it's good enough tomorrow. Because I'm not the one proclaiming that it's good. It's God who's proclaiming that it's good because it's His Word. Amen? So this morning, I just want you to go ahead and stand. We're going to just worship for a moment. And I want us to begin just approaching church, approaching life, approaching everything that we do with this mentality. And the the mentality is that we need Jesus. It's not just a matter of like, this is my checklist. I came to church on Sunday. No, we need Jesus. And whatever it is that God calls you to do, you got to do. I shared it last week. I'll, I'll share it briefly because we are filming right now. But uh, Annie and I did receive that foster placement this past week, and it stretches you, and it changes things, and it changes our flow, but it's what God called us to do, and so we did it. So even as we think back to the word that Donna gave us earlier uh, today, we need to hear what God's calling us to do and then do it. Don't wait. When God says go, you go. 
Delayed obedience is not obedience, it's disobedience. Immediate obedience is obedience. So I want us to just take a moment, and I just want us to, to worship as a church. I'm going to come back up in a moment, and I'll pray. We'll do Great Commission. I'll give you uh, the announcements. But here's what I want you as an individual to be challenged by and us as a church. If you can pray this for us as a church, is that we would be a congregation that would say, you know what, whatever it is, Jesus, I'll do it. If you need to change what my perception is, if you need to change the, the things that matter to me, because, again, the things of this world, God already knows what the script is. God knows what's going to happen tonight. God knows what's going to happen a week from now. God knows what's going to happen a year from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now. He knows everything that's going to happen until he comes again. Nothing surprises him. So we don't need to worry about the script. We need to worry about, God, what is it that I'm supposed to do today? Unless you have an audience with different kings or presidents or governors, you don't have a lot of impact on them, but you do have an impact on your neighbor. You do have an impact on, oh, let me, let me just back up for a moment. You can have an impact on presidents and governors and mayors and pray for them. You don't like what they're doing? Pray for them. Not what you think is good, but what God thinks is good. Because God's sitting on the throne and God's in control. So would you just, would you just worship and say, okay, God, whatever it is that I think is good, throw it away unless it's you. If it's you, then let me hold on to it. But if it's something that this is a personal opinion, this is something I'm holding on to, that maybe what you believe to be good is even contradicting with what God's word believes to be good, if your good and God's good don't line up, your good's wrong. But if your good and God's good line up, then proclaim that truth because that is God's good and no matter what happens, God's got your back. So let's just worship for just a few moments.